Hello and welcome to the Daily News Simplified, an answer to watch why and how of newspaper reading. Today we will be analyzing the important news appearing in the Delhi edition of the Hindu newspaper dated 6th March 2020. The topics to be discussed today are reflected on your screen and the time stamping for the same has been provided in the description box below. So let's start. This news has been taken from page number 12 titled Anglo-Indian protest at Jantar Mantar. Now this discussion of ours is important from the perspective of polity. Now recently the Parliament of India has passed 126th Constitutional Amendment Bill which has now been enacted into 104th Constitutional Amendment Act of 2020 which came into force in end of January. Now as per this 104th Constitutional Amendment Act, this Act has amended Article 334 of the Indian Constitution whereby it has extended the reservation for the scheduled caste and the scheduled tribe in the various legislatures for another 10 years up till 2030. And secondly, this amendment act has ended the representation which was provided for the Anglo-Indian communities in the legislature. So from the perspective of your prelims, these two points become very important. And please also keep in mind the number of this constitutional amendment, that is 104th Constitutional Amendment Act. And this is also the latest amendment to the constitution. Now it was due to this removal of representation for the Anglo-Indians that Action Council, which is a collective of Anglo-Indian associations in India, are protesting in Jantar Mantar against this 104th Constitutional Amendment Act. Now the background of this news is that part 16 of the Indian constitution provides special provisions relating to certain classes. Now article 330 and 332 of the Indian constitution provide for reservation for the scheduled caste and the scheduled tribe communities in the Lok Sabha and in the state legislative assembly respectively based on their population ratio. Article 330 speaks about reservation in the Lok Sabha and Article 332 speaks about reservation in the state legislative assembly. Furthermore, Article 331 clearly states that the President of India can nominate two members of the Anglo-Indian community if he feels that they are not adequately represented. So the president makes this nomination of two Anglo-Indians to the Lok Sabha. On similar lines, under Article 333, the governor of any state can also nominate one Anglo-Indian to the state legislative assembly if he feels that the Anglo-Indian community is not adequately represented in the state legislative assembly. Now, originally, these provisions related to reservation and special representation was to operate for 10 years, that is up to 1960 only. However, this duration has been extended continuously since then by 10 years each time. And the last amendment to this effect was made in 2009, where this reservation and special representation was extended till 2020. Now, Article 334 of the Indian Constitution states, Reservation of seats and special representation to cease after 70 years. So, the last amendment was made in the year 2009, following which these reservation and representation was extended till the year 2020. So, Article 334 clearly states that seats will be reserved for the scheduled caste and the scheduled tribes in the House of the People and the Legislative State Assemblies. And even the representation of Anglo-Indian community will continue in the House of People and in the State and in the Legislative Assembly of the State by nomination. And these two provisions will cease to have an effect after the expiration of period of 70 years from the commencement of this constitution, which meant it will expire in 2020. So therefore, to extend this, the government came out with 104th Constitutional Amendment Act. However, through this act, the government has extended the reservation for the ST and the ST for for another 10 years. However, they have ended the representation for the Anglo-Indian community. So this is the basic crux about 104th Constitutional Amendment Act. Now, in an earlier DNS dated 17th December 2019, we have spoken in detail as to why the reservation for Anglo-Indian community should be continued. In this DNS, we analyzed an editorial with respect to extension of the representation for Anglo-Indian community. Therefore, if you want to have more information as to why representation for the Anglo-Indian community should be extended, 
you can refer to this DNS of 17th December. With this, let's take up our next news. This news appears on page number 12 and it is in the context of the recent decision of Lok Sabha where on Thursday it has suspended seven Congress MPs for rest of the budget session. Hence, in this discussion of ours today, we will be talking about the suspension and expulsion of MPs which will be important from the perspective of polity. Now, as far as suspension of a member of parliament is concerned, in the Lok Sabha, the speaker has two powers, namely, he can force an MP to withdraw from the house for the remaining part of the day. And second, the speaker can place an MP under suspension. So, speaker can do two things. He can either ask the member to withdraw from the house for the remaining or the rest of the day or he can place an MP under suspension for the remaining session. Now, it is Rule 374 of the Rules of Procedure for Conduct of Business in the Lok Sabha which talk about suspension of an MP. Now, under these rules, the Speaker can name a Member of Parliament who disregards the authority of the Chair or abuses the rules of the House by persistently and willfully obstructing the business therefore. Furthermore, the member so named can be suspended from the service of the house for the remaining session. Now here, either the speaker can directly suspend the person as has happened in the present case or any other member too can put a motion in front of the house for suspending any other MP. So please remember that the speaker himself too can suspend an MP from the Lok Sabha. Furthermore, this suspension is only for the remaining period of the session. So currently the budget session is going on. So these seven MPs will remain suspended only for the budget session and not for the next session. Additionally, also keep in mind that speaker can only place a person under suspension and cannot revoke the suspension. The authority for revoking the suspension order is vested in the house. Hence, it is for the House, that is the Lok Sabha, to decide the question of revocation of a MP through a motion put forth in the House. So, here is another important point that Speaker can only place a person under suspension and cannot revoke it. Revocation power lies with the House, that is with the Lok Sabha. Now, as far as Rajya Sabha is concerned, the Chairman of the Rajya Sabha does not have the power to suspend any person on his own. Hence, a motion by another member has to be moved if a MP or a, if a member of Rajya Sabha has to be suspended. And similarly, just with the case of Lok Sabha, a person in the Rajya Sabha will only be suspended for a period not exceeding the remainder of the session. Lastly, as far as expulsion of an MP is concerned, the Speaker can carry out the expulsion of an MP on the basis of recommendation of a committee. Now, either the case can be referred to the Ethics Committee, which is a standing committee of the Parliament, or a Speaker can constitute a fact-finding committee specifically for the case of misconduct. Now, based on the recommendation of the committee, a motion is adopted in the House whether the MP should be expelled or not. Now, as far as the Ethics Committee is concerned, Ethics Committee oversees the moral and ethical conduct of the members and also prepares a code of conduct for its member which is amended from time to time. Now in the Lok Sabha, the Ethics Committee comprises of 15 members whereas in the Rajya Sabha, it comprises of 10 members. Now any member can make a complaint to the committee or the Ethics Committee can suomoto take note of the matter. And where it has been found out that the member has indulged in unethical behavior or there is any other misconduct on part of the member, the committee may recommend imposition of one or more sanctions which can include a reprimand, censure or even a suspension. So this is all what is required from the perspective of prelims as far as suspension and expulsion of member of parliament is concerned. With this, let's take up our next news. Now this news appears on page number 11 and it is on the topic whether the sedition law should be scrapped or not. Before we go on to see what opinions has been, have been given by the interviewees in this article, let us first revise a previous lecture where we have covered and spoken about sedition in length. Let's start with what exactly is sedition 
Now, sedition is a criminal offence defined under Section 124 of the Indian Penal Code. Section 124A of the IPC defines sedition as whoever by words, either spoken or written, or by signs, or by any visible representation or otherwise, brings or attempts to bring into hatred and contempt, or excites or attempts to excite dissatisfaction towards the government established by law, shall be punished with imprisonment for life, to which fine may be added, or with imprisonment which may extend to three years, to which fine may be added, or with fine. So this definition has certain constituents. The first is any person with words which can either be spoken or written or even by signs or some other kind of visible representation. A good example of visible representation will be the cartoons by Indian cartoonist Asim Trivedi who was jailed on sedition charges. So whoever by all these actions brings or even attempts to bring, hence in sedition even an attempt is punishable. So if the actions are bringing or attempting to bring hatred or contempt or is trying to excite any kind of dissatisfaction towards the government, then that person will be charged with sedition, punishment for which varies from three years to imprisonment for life. Further, the section provides us with certain explanation, according to which, firstly, dissatisfaction would include any kind of disloyalty or a feeling of enmity towards the government. Secondly, in explanation, we have been provided with two exceptions to this law of sedition. The first is any kind of comments which is expressing any kind of condemnation towards the measure of the government with an intent or with a view to obtain a change or alteration of that government measures and if such comments do not have the attention to excite hatred, contempt or dissatisfaction, then they will not constitute an offence under this section. Therefore, if a person does not have the intention to excite hatred, contempt or dissatisfaction, but is rather only expressing his dissatisfaction with certain measures of the government and is criticizing the government just to bring an alteration of such measures, then that will not constitute a sedition. Hence, the section itself recognizes that healthy criticism is an exception to sedition. The second exception is similar. Whoever through his comments is trying to express disapprobation, disapprobation means condemnation. Hence, whoever is condemning the administrative or any other kind of action of the government without exciting hatred or contempt, then that too will not constitute an offence under this section. Now, generally the debates around sedition is centred on sedition versus the freedom of speech and expression. Now, we know that Article 91 guarantees the freedom of speech and expression, which is subject to certain reasonable limitations or restrictions provided for under Article 192. Now, the reasonable restrictions provided under Article 192 includes the interest of the sovereignty and the integrity of India, the security of the state, friendly relation with foreign states, public order, decency or morality, or in relation to contempt of court, defamation or incitement to an offence. So, usually it is said that sedition flows from this reasonable limitations provided for under Article 19 Clause 2, specifically protecting the sovereignty and integrity of India as well as the security of the state and in order to maintain public order, decency or morality. Next, let us talk about the author's view which I presented in this article. The first and the foremost is the most common criticism to sedition, that is sedition is being used as a tool to curb the political dissent. The author says that it is a matter of concern that political speeches are being criminalized to the extent that they are deemed to be an offence against the state. In fact, in recent years, there has been an alarming rise in sedition charges because it is being used as a reprehensible measure to curb political dissent. Secondly, the author feels that there is another school of thought which feels that a modern democracy like India does not need a free speech restriction which is based on colonial concepts of speech restrictions. Because even Britain, who introduced this offence of sedition way back in 1870, in order to curb the political dissent of Indians back then, so that they cannot criticize the colonial administration, they too have abolished sedition. Thirdly, the author feels that the real mischief or the real problem with sedition lies in its definition, which is very wide in scope. Because its definition also takes into fold not just incitement to take up arms, 
but also harmless criticism of the government policies or actions. Therefore, by using sedition, even criticism of the government of the day is not allowed. Hence, the author feels that this vague and wide scope of the definition of sedition opens up a lot of room for debate as to whether that action did cause sedition or not. Now, in addition to author's view, there are other two points as well. Fourth is that gauging whether a person had the intention to incite disaffection towards the government or whether his actions had the tendency or the potential to incite such kind of hatred or contempt is again very subjective because of the fact that the law has not provided us with certain quantifiable tests to see what amounts to sedition in the end gauging the intent and tendency is left to the court itself which again can become very subjective lastly in a modern parliamentary democracy like ours the citizens of our country have the right to information that is they have the right to gather information on government policies and action and further they also have the fundamental right of freedom of speech and expression to criticize the actions of the government because obviously if a citizen is dissatisfied with the government policy he has the right to criticize it because until and unless the dissatisfaction is not voiced the government can also not be held accountable so these are the major points against sedition let us also very briefly look what the law commission and the supreme court of india has said about sedition let us talk about the various judgments of the supreme court and the opinion it has shared on sedition now the supreme court in the case of ramesh thapur versus the state of madras declared that unless the freedom of speech and expression threaten the security of our country or tend to overthrow the state or the government any law imposing restriction upon the same will not fall within the purview of article 19 clause 2 of the constitution hence in this case it said that only those actions which are threatening security of our of our country or have the actual potential to overthrow the present government only those cases can be tried for sedition then in the year 1962 the supreme court in the case of kedarnath versus the state of bihar ruled in favor of the constitutional validity of section 124a of the ipc and in fact tried to strike a balance between article 191 and section 124a of the ipc in kedarnath the court said that a person shall be prosecuted for sedition only if his acts caused incitement to violence or his acts had the intention or the tendency to create public disorder or cause disturbance of the public peace hence in kadarna the court said there has to be some real tendency or a real potential of an action of the accused to create public disorder and not just anything including a mere criticism can be considered to bring in a turmoil now recently even the law commission of india came out with a consultation paper on sedition now the law commission observed that dissent and criticism are essential ingredients of a robust public debate in a vibrant democracy like india so therefore if today india cannot be open to positive criticism then there is actually no difference between the pre and the post independence era further the law commission emphasized on the fundamental right given under article 19 of the constitution where the people have the right to criticize their own history and their government further the law commission said that every restriction which is placed on free speech and expression has to be carefully scrutinized in order to avoid unwarranted restrictions which simply means that just because the constitution under article 19 clause 2 has provided for certain reasonable restriction that does not mean that the government will invoke such restrictions as and when they like for every kind of political dissent or criticism further the law commission said that people in this country have the liberty and the freedom to express their affections towards the government or towards the country in a way they want to hence it said that singing from the same song book is not a benchmark of patriotism patriotism is subjective and everybody has a right to express it the way they want it next a mere expression of frustration over the state of affairs in a country cannot be treated as sedition so just because somebody is expressing a view or a thought which is not in congruity or in consonance with the political view of the ruling party or with the majority of the people does not mean that the person has to be charged under the provision of sedition and lastly the law commission considered whether it will be worthwhile to rename section 124a and also to find a suitable substitute for the term sedition 
Now in this article, the interviewee is of the opinion that the cases of sedition which are filed rarely ever lead to convictions. The case of sedition is often invoked so as to suppress the dissenters and the government is not really interested in conviction. In fact, many a time, even the sanction for prosecution is not granted for the cases of sedition. So the main idea behind charging a person with sedition is to instill fear in their mind and curb dissent. Secondly, it is felt that even if the case goes to the prosecution, it will not lead to any kind of conviction because during the trial, the case which has been met out against a person will not pass the test as was laid in the Kedarnath case. As stated in the Kedarnath case, the seditious speech should result in actual incitement to violence. Furthermore, the interviewee is of the opinion that in today's India, the police is not free from the political pressures from the political parties. Therefore, any local leader can bully a policeman into registering a case. Furthermore, a very important point regarding Section 124A, which needs to be kept in mind, is that sedition or Section 124A of the IPC is against the state and not against the government. By this we mean that the Supreme Court has clearly stated that the seditious statement should be against the state and not against the ruling government. Therefore, criticizing government's decision or policy stance is not sedition. However, if a person speaks against the constitutional state of India and tries to incite violence amongst people, then this will attract the section of sedition. Now coming to the question whether sedition should be repealed or not, the two interviewees have different and opposite opinions. As for one, yes, the law of sedition should be repealed because if we keep such a harsh and draculian law on the statute book, it will lead to its misuse and abuse. Therefore, we should remove the law of sedition altogether so that there can be no misuse. Furthermore, the interviewee is of the opinion that as far as hate speech or any other kind of speech which incites violence, we can have specific laws to deal with it. Sedition as a law is very wide, encompassing a lot of components within its ambit. Furthermore, on the question whether the impetus to repeal or change the law will come from the judiciary or will come from the parliament, one interviewee is of the opinion that the change of course has to come from judiciary because the parliament or the politicians are very reluctant to do away with the law of sedition. Hence it is felt that the judiciary should look into and revisit its earlier decisions and update the filters and the safeguard it provided earlier. Therefore probably we need a larger constitution bench to deal with the question of sedition and if at all the judiciary is not in favour of repealing it, at least judiciary should come out with new safeguards or certain essential features which need to be present before the case of sedition can be tried. The other interviewee is of the opinion that no, the law of sedition should not be repealed because if law of sedition is removed, then some other law will be misused. Hence, any law can be misused or abused. Furthermore, this interviewee is of the opinion that the judiciary should now set up a search committee in every state and should assign a particular judge of the high court who will sue more to check all the cases of sedition which are being filed and if the judge is of the opinion that that case is baseless then there is no need to even proceed with the trial of that case. This interviewee feels that it is upon the judiciary to filter the cases of sedition and the ordinary citizens should not be subjected to the harassment and the ordeal of coming to the court for such seditious cases. Therefore, the need of the R is for our legal aid system to become more stronger and robust. Lastly, as far as changing or repealing the law is concerned, this interview feels that it is the parliament who can only change this law, as is evident in the case of POTA as well. POTA or the Prevention of Terrorism Act of, 20, of 2002, which was again a draconian law, was also revoked by the parliament. Therefore, it is only the parliamentarians when they get a push from the public that they swing into action and are likely to change or repeal this law. So this was all about this article. Let's take up our next news. This news appears on page number 13 titled India among least free democracy stays, says study. 
Now this news is important from the perspective of polity and governance, more so from the viewpoint of the prelims. Now recently, Freedom House, which is a US-based democracy watchdog, has released the Freedom in the World Report 2020. Now this Freedom House is the oldest American organization dedicated to the support and defense of democracy around the world. Now as far as India's rank is concerned, India has been placed at a decimal position of 83rd rank along with other countries such as Senegal, Timor-Leste, etc. Furthermore, the report has also placed India in the category of countries in the spotlight for the year 2020 along with other countries such as Iran, Sudan, Tunisia, Turkey, Hong Kong, Ukraine, etc. Now this category of countries in the spotlight show a list of all those countries where important developments have affected the democratic nature of the country. Now though almost half of the world's democratic countries have seen a degradation or a fall in their scores, however the drop or the fall by India is the largest amongst all the democratic countries in the world. Furthermore, India's score fell by 4 points, which is the worst decline among the world's 25 largest democracies this year. Remembering the scores of the categories is not important. Now, the reason cited by this report for the downfall in India's rank is firstly the abrogation of Article 370 and the subsequent internet shutdown or blackout in Kashmir which, as per the report, was the longest shutdown ever imposed by a democracy. The second reason is the Citizenship Amendment Act and the subsequent massive crackdown by the government on the mass protest which the people had organized in protest of the CEA. Third reason was the NRC exercise which was concluded in Assam. In addition to these three major reasons, the report also says that freedom of expression is under threat in India. And a lot of journalists, academics and other people are facing harassment and intimidation when they are addressing political sensitive topics. Therefore, due to all these developments, India's drop is the sharpest and the report has also stated and I quote, These events can blur the value-based distinction between Beijing and New Delhi. Furthermore, the only reason India was put under the free category was because of the conduct of elections last year. However, this report has criticized the present government for pushing India away from the founding commitment to pluralism and individual rights, which are the hallmark for any democracy. Now, in addition to this Freedom in the World Index, there are some other important freedom indices as well. The foremost of them is the Democracy Index, which is published every year by the Economist Intelligence Unit. Second is the Worldwide Press Freedom Index, compiled and published by Reporters Without Border. And in addition to this, the Freedom House, which has released this Freedom in the World report, also publishes an annual Freedom of the Press Index. This list is not exhaustive, but the Democracy Index and the Press Freedom Index are two important indices as far as the Freedom Examination is concerned. With this, let's take up our next news. This news appears on page number 15, titled, Zydus Cadillac to launch drug for Nash. Now recently, Zydus Cadillac has received the DCGI's approval for a new drug application for its drug, Saroglitazar, to treat Nash. Nash stands for non-serotic, non-alcoholic stateohepatitis. The reason this news is important is because this is the first ever treatment in the world for Nash. Now, as far as this drug, Saroglitazar, is concerned, this drug was launched in India itself in September 2013 for treatment of diabetic-related health conditions. Now, in 2013, when this drug, Saroglitazar, was launched, it was the first treatment which was discovered and developed indigenously by an Indian drug maker. Hence, for this reason also, Saroglitazar becomes important as it was the first treatment discovered or the first indigenous, indigenously developed drug by an Indian drug maker. Now, NASH ranks as one, of the major, as one of the major causes for cirrhosis, hepatitis C and even alcoholic liver disease. In fact, in the severe cases of the NASH disease, liver transplantation is the only option left. Now, as far as the Drug Controller General of India is concerned, 
The DCGI is a department under the Central Drug Standards Control Organization of the Government of India. The DCGI comes under the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare and its main role is to approve license for very specific categories of drugs such as blood, blood products, IV fluid, vaccines, etc. Other responsibility of the DCGI includes laying down standards and quality of manufacturing and distribution of drugs in India. It also acts as an appellate authority in case of any dispute regarding the quality of drugs. It also prepares and maintains a national reference standard as far as various drugs are concerned. And it ensures that the Drugs and Cosmetic Act is, is enforced uniformly in the entire country. And lastly, it also trains various drug analysts for the state drug control laboratories and other institutions. So please remember that the DCGI is a department under the CDSCO. And also remember the details about saroglitazar. With this, let's take up our next news. Now this news has been taken from page number 2 of the Friday Review magazine. And it is with respect to Pandit Ravi Shankar. Now to celebrate the birth sanitary of Pandit Ravi Shankar, a small celebration known as Smaran was organized. Hence, in this regard, we will be speaking about Pandit Ravi Shankar and his contribution to the Hindustani classical music. Now, Pandit Ravi Shankar was a very well-known Indian musician and composer of the Hindustani classical music. He was the best-known proponent of sitar during the second half of the 20th century. In the year 1999, he was awarded Bharat Ratna, India's highest civilian honour. Now, Pandit Ravi Shankar is known to incorporate various influences from the Carnatic music into the Hindustani classical music. Furthermore, his performances began with a solo alap, followed by Jor and Jhala, and was also influenced by serious Dhrupa Dhyanar. Pandit Ravi Shankar often closed, often closed his performance with a piece inspired by the light classical Thumri Yonar. So as far as Pandit Ravi Shankar is concerned, remember he was associated with Hindustani classical music, he was a proponent of sitar, he was awarded Bharat Ratna and his contribution is that he has incorporated certain rhythmic practices from the Carnatic music into the Hindustani classical music. Now since we have mentioned Hindustani classical music, let us very quickly go through this table which, which compares the Hindustani and Carnatic music. Now, Hindustani music was prevalent in northern region, whereas Carnatic music was prevalent in South India. Hindustani music was influenced by Vedic philosophy and certain Persian elements, whereas Carnatic music was more indigenous temple kind of music. Now, the various major vocal forms and styles in the Hindustani classical music include Dhrupad, Khayal, Thumri and Tarana. And major vocal forms of Carnatic music include Pallavi, Anupallavi, Varnam and Ragamalika. As far as the timeline is concerned, Hindustani music dates back to 3rd century and it rose to prominence in the 13th century AD. Whereas Carnatic music dates back to 15th and 16th century AD. So out of the two, it was the Hindustani classical music which emerged first. Now the instruments associated with the Hindustani classical music include tabla, tanpura, sarangi, sitar, shehnai, flute, etc. And the instruments associated with Carnatic music include veena, mridangam, ghatam, violin, udukai, etc. Now with Hindustani classical music, various gharanas are associated such as the dagri, dhar, such as the dagri gharana, gwalior gharana, agra gharana, kirana gharana and darbhanga gharana. Whereas Carnatic music is not associated with any kind of gharana. Lastly, in Hindustani classical music, there was always scope to improvise. Whereas in Carnatic music, there was no freedom to improvise. Hindustani classical music required a vocal centric group, where a singer was accompanied by many instruments being played by a group. On the other hand, in the Carnatic music, the singer himself laid stress on the vocal musical lead. This chart has been attached in your PDF for further reference. Now with this, let's take up our practice questions. Now based on our today's discussion, here is your prelims practice question 
Please pause the video and solve them. We'll discuss the answer after 5 seconds. Question number 1 reads, consider the following statements regarding suspension of a member of parliament. First, chairman of Rajya Sabha can suspend an MP on his own without a motion being passed by the house. Now this is incorrect because this power is only available with the speaker and not with the chairman of the Rajya Sabha. Second statement, speaker of Lok Sabha cannot suomoto revoke the suspension. Now this is correct because to revoke the suspension, motion needs to be passed by the house. Hence the correct answer becomes B, 2 only. Question number 2 is regarding the Carnatic style of music. First statement, it originated before Hindustani classical music. Now this is incorrect. Hindustani classical music, uh, Hindustani classical music originated before the Carnatic music. Second, no freedom of improvisation is given in this style. This is correct. Hence the right answer becomes B, 2 only. Question number 3 reads, which of the following statements regarding 104th Constitution Amendment Act is correct? First, it extended the reservation for the STSC community for another 10 years. This is correct. Second, it ended the representation of the Anglo-Indian communities in the legislature. This is also correct. Hence, the right answer becomes C, both 1 and 2. With this, we come to an end for today's discussion. Let's take up the question for the day. Now the question for today reads, which of the pairs given below is correctly matched? Number one, Democracy Index and the Economist Intelligence Unit. Second, Press Freedom Index and Reporters Without Borders. Select the correct answer using the code given below. A, one only. B, two only. C, both one and two. D. Neither one nor two. And the answer for yesterday's question is C. Article 19.